like to say thank you for making it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let's start out real soft. That was a lot, I'm sure. Okay, no curveballs. Um, you told me that you've known each other for years, yeah. and that kind of making movies is a culmination of your friendship. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it kind of started, I guess, quick, very, very quickly. Like, our origin story was, um, you know, we're both from St. Louis, I'm from, originally from Ferguson, and Jason owns a coffee shop that you actually see in the movie. And uh, he had one of his coffee shops was in Clayton, which is, you know, predominantly this white area. So I had a meeting at a shop with somebody, and there was a lot of white people there, obviously. And uh, Jason was going around to uh, every table and was like, um, uh, do you like the coffee? Are you enjoying, like, uh, are, you, are you enjoying the atmosphere? That kind of thing. I was like, bro, you own this? Like, you own this establishment? That's incredible. So I had to reach out to him. I did. Uh, uh, and I had something online that was a short film line that was essentially going viral. And uh, from there, you know, a couple months later, we connected. And then he was just like, you know what, I'm in. Like, let's, let's, let's do this. So, okay, so when we, we talked earlier, I think I misunderstood. You did not grow up together, or were you like six years old in the coffee shop? Oh, no, no, yeah, well, right, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm much younger. <laughs> Although we did go to uh, the same high school, ironically, so that's kind of interesting, yeah. Absolutely. Um, we only have a little bit of time, so I, I, I prepared so much stuff, and I'm on a condense it down. One thing that I like to look for when I watch a film is if there is a filmmaker's command. And I think that what I saw, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the license plate search. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> pick it up from there. All right, pick it up. Okay, yeah, so search, let's see. Um, I think this entire film is really a culmination of so many different things in my life. Uh, you know, me being a you know openly queer man. Uh, you know, and you know the events of Ferguson, uh, which is where I'm from. You know, the you know the death of Michael Brown. Um, uh, you know, I was in college at the time when it happened, and it just kind of did something to me where you know you know I'm, I'm on the streets protesting uh, with my peers, and you know I'm seeing you know this global. Uh, movement happened uh, and it's called for uh, uh, a justice, black justice. And it was, you know, it, it just hit me that, you know, you know, even though like I, I love sci-fi, like I love obviously like, I love Star Wars and stuff like that. You know, I love superhero flicks, but you know, in my craft and what I do in my storytelling, I think I have somewhat more responsibility to, to, to say something. And um, uh, throughout my life, I, I feel like I've always just kind of been on this, uh, 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 this search for, you know, what I want to say and maximizing all of my potential and things like that. So you saw in the film, you know, you know, even though I had tremendous help, like a lot of help, um, you know, I mean, just me and my, my friends making, you know, making a film over the course of a, you know, a couple of years, but, you know, I wrote it, directed it, I had, you know, did the editing, and also I'm a musician. So you I composed made, the music. Okay. Yeah, I did the, the music too. I did the music too. Um, and that was something that was a push from him. He told me I needed to do the music. So <laughs> That was a good push. I didn't want to do it. Push in the right direction. Right, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, but yeah, so search. And that's kind of what this film is really about. It's really about legacy. It's about searching for legacy and uh, connecting the dots. And um, yeah, I'll just... Yeah, I love that. And and before we I would before we get into the movie itself, I would like to hear your definition of Afrofuturism. And we can start with you, Jason. Wow. Um, my definition of Afrofuturism is is just being balanced, and not having any guardrails on ideas, thoughts, and um, I mean it's kin to. What's akin to now? Like, you know, what were they talking about in, uh, in, in education right now with the idea of, um, what is it now? You know, like in education right now, in education right now, there's, there's, there's plenty of talk about. You mean the revisionist history type stuff? Oh, revisionist history, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I don't like getting my thoughts together. That was us. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but yeah, but but it's getting that. But just being, just having the ability to to think, wander outside of you know what you know, and uh, and not having any guardrails on that. And so that's kind of what the future of this. Yeah, the liberation of the mind. And how does that work in? Art, because I think that Afrofuturism presents itself a little differently in music, right. movies, uh, visual arts, but then also in politics. Right. I mean, it's it's ultimately because you know, uh, if you guys want to get a really good laugh, you should go to my YouTube channel and check out the comment section um, because <laughs> <laughs> because I posted a clip of the movie like a few days ago, and uh, I remember this one comment. Because in the title of it, it said, a clip, exclusive clip underneath Children of the Sun, Afrofuturist film by you know, David Kirk and blah, 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 right? And one of the comments says, so if this is Afrofuturism, does that mean everything else is Eurofuturism? <laughs> because it's like, uh, my comment to him respectfully, or her, whoever it was typing on keyboard, respectfully was, you know, if I make, you know, uh, a, a dramatic movie, because I mean every other movie is a comedy, you know, by that <laughs> line of thinking, and, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense. So with Afrofuturism, it's not necessarily the negation of or neglecting uh, um, uh, all the other genres. It, what, it, what it's saying is it's very specific in its... Uh, in how it centers blackness and black stories and the control of all of those narratives coming from an authentic black voice. And so that's kind of what Afrofuturism is to me and we kind of been really defining it over the years and it's really just become this mainstream thing. I'm sure everybody has seen like Black Panther, uh, you know, uh, and but there's been you know, and that's that's a that's very like pop, uh, Disney uh, mainstream yeah. Afrofuturism. It, it, but then we talked about filmmakers like Sun Ra. Right, exactly. Like people like Sun Ra, and uh, you know, even currently like Janelle Monae. Um, and there, there's just been so many people who have been on the ground floor for years, really defining what Afrofuturism is, and uh, really been in the trenches. I was introduced to it a few years ago, really. Um, uh, I didn't even know that's what it was until somebody told me that's kind of what it was. I was just, you know, just doing what I thought. And you know, exploring right? Afrofuturism is also a way for you as an artist to help liberate your own mind, right? Um, when I thought I had a whole hour and a half to spend with y'all, I was going to break this down into Filmmaker 101 and then Filmmaker Vision, but we're just going to get right into it. First, let's start with um, the visuals, the costumes, the language that you chose to use. Can you talk about the elements in the film? Right, so in the planning for the movie, I, I mean, Jason already knew that I wanted to do a movie that, you know, you want it to be this huge kind of spectacle. And I remember, so the places that you saw where we were shooting the sand dunes was actually in Colorado. <laughs> People thought we were in the, you know, Sahara Desert or something in Africa, which, you know, obviously we didn't have a budget for anything nowhere near that. But so we were in Colorado, we were out there, we went out there several times. Uh, you know, the, we were in the Rocky Mountains, the great sand dunes there. And then uh, we shot mostly the rest of it in the St. Louis surrounding area. Um, even the plantation, uh, we were the first production to shoot on President Ulysses Grant Estate. And um, uh, I'm not sure something to brag about or anything, but you know, but uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, Really, very interesting to shoot shoot there. Um, you know the how the mansion is like green. It was green like that back in the day. You know we're so used to seeing. Um, I say this all the time. Yeah, we're so used to seeing uh, plantations depicted a very specific way. Uh, you know the, the big White House. You know that the kind of mansion. Yeah, and so uh, to see that could be kind of like well, that's a choice, why did they choose a greenhouse? Like we chose it, that was a house that existed back in the day that had slaves on it. Um, uh, um, and so, I'm sorry, what was, what was the question? And so we're talking about, we're talking about uh, oh, locations, it's all costumes, okay. So yeah, so. It, it, so, was, it was multi-layered, it was like. Yeah, 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 I was, like, I was trying to make sure, yeah. Okay, so yeah, costumes and whatnot, uh, the 
was more of an economical choice to, you know, we knew we could do, you know, the future, the futuristic aspects, no, the futuristic aspects we wanted to show, uh, we knew that we didn't want to go overboard with it because we didn't want to take the viewer out of, you know, the experience uh, because we're working on a micro budget. So, uh, you know, everybody just wear black. So, <laughs> and that solves a problem right there. Uh, you can't really see that many textures on black and, they, you know, you get a very uh, unique silhouette as well. We had a makeup artist who we brought in from, uh, 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 she's from St. Louis but lived in Las Vegas at the time. And you know she did you know the tribal makeup and whatnot. The language is Amharic, which is the official language of uh, Ethiopia. Um, my nod to Ethiopia was was that element of the film mostly because uh, you know we for for various and obvious reasons you know we hear a lot about West Africa uh, because of slave trade and things like that. But a lot of people don't know that Ethiopia was one, if not I think it was probably the only country that never got colonized in the world. And uh, it was my nod to Ethiopia's uh, resilience and strength and uh, the power that they've exuded throughout history. So I decided to use that language throughout the film. It's a great choice. I want to ask... I was going to say, it's also interesting that you know, you, know, you thought about Ethiopia because, you know, probably is indigenous to Ethiopia. So having that uh, in the coffee business and Ethiopia in the language, so it's kind of interesting how it's all pulled together. Yeah, I thought it was a beautiful choice, um, the language, and I didn't know it, I recognized it. Um, and so I, I want to ask you the tough question I was going to try to ease into it, but I'm just going to come out with it. Can you talk to me about the anatomy of a whipping scene? Because I'll say this from my, my own experience watching it. I watched the movie first on my laptop. And I was like, yeah, okay, I got it. It's, you know, but then when seeing it on the big screen, I felt it and then I wondered about the actors and if you had to protect them in the scene and all those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, number one, we're filming on this plantation. So there's already a air of, oh man, this, we are on, we're, we're, we're filming on history, you know? Um, and when we did that scene specifically, it was very interesting because there are tours that are happening around this plantation. So there's not a lot of black people on these tours, number one. <laughs> and so people who are coming in uh, are thinking that you know, they're getting some kind of play or something. And that's not reality. You know, this is, I mean, we're just filming a movie. For the actors themselves, uh, it was, you know, for, for both the white and black actors, it was extremely difficult to, to, to get into the mindset um, of, of the roles that they, you know, that they had to play. I remember one time, you know, one of the actors had actually, one of the, the actors who, who was a slave owner, we had rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed for months. And then we get on set and he physically can't say the N word. You know, um, because now it's now it's a thing. And now everything's become tangible. And the guy who, um, uh, the actor who got whipped in that scene, Bruce, uh, man, kudos to him. Uh, but he did so much research on, you know, on it. My approach to, the slavery aspect of our film was not to make it as, um, was not indulge in the grotesqueness of slavery. You know, um, so there's like no blood in the film. Um, you know, I wanted to make my point and just kind of move on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other pieces out there I think that um, are a lot more realistic. In yes. Its, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I was going to just say, I think Bruce, the actor who was being um, with in the, in the movie, I think he's amazing. He was very docile. I mean, he was, I mean, his, just how he was being spoken to um, by the master, it was just like, I mean, I felt it when I first saw it. I just think he did an excellent job. He really sold that scene. And I think he's one of the best characters in the movie, honestly. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I was going to say this for later, but for me, Georgie Porgy was... 
the one I resonated with the most. And what I thought I saw, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that this character kind of centers around this idea of crabs in a barrel. This is something that we talk about and think about a lot. And what I appreciated about the thread between him and Amir is that they're not so dissimilar. Um, Georgie, in the beginning, is saying, we all want to run, we all want to leave, but there are creature comforts, there's food we need, right? And then by the end, and, and of course I'm like, man, get up out of here, kind of thing, you know? But in the end, what I thought is, when we're thinking about crabs in a barrel, we're thinking about it like, we don't want you to get out, we don't want you to make it, we don't want you to succeed. But in the final scene with him, you changed my mind. You made me think it's more the pain of being abandoned and continuous suffering. Yes, and just the reference of what you know. You know, uh, you know, if, yeah. And in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the film, you know, he's talking to Amir and he's saying, you know, you're gonna be stuck out in that forest running around, <laughs> for 40 years, running around like Moses. It's like a biblical reference, but you know, it's just like it's just like how are you gonna how are you gonna eat. You know, it's like you, you can't think outside of the, the confines that have been set up for him. And Amir is not trying to be rude, but you know, he's technically from the future, stuck in the past. And so he has to dumb down his language just to be relatable. And you can only you can only um, imagine where you can possibly be based on what you've been exposed to. And George was just never exposed to the other side. He was never exposed to what it would have, I mean, all of them were really never exposed to what it would be like to be free. So for him to even think that was a possibility, it's like, yeah, I might entertain a dog, but this is cool for me. Even though there is, we, the slave masters are, they're killed. They could have been left, but like where? You know, what direction are we gonna go? Like, it's just that uncertainty. And um, it, it is something to think, I mean, I mean, if I put myself in his shoes, I, you know, I mean, that's a hard decision to make, um, uh, which is, you know, near the end of the film, it really does tie, you know, a lot of it ties back into just choices and decisions that you make uh, uh, really to, to, to liberate yourself. Um, in one reality, uh, George and the group decide to stay. In the other reality, George and the group decide to leave. So, and that's kind of that's kind of typical, right? It's, you know, some people don't. You know, they, they when 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 you think about that time period, everyone, everyone's like, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but some people are like, well, I would have just left. I would have ran away. Yeah. I would have fought the slave owner. Like you don't know that. Yeah, there's so many of us, right, and right. one or two. Your them. imagination is limited, which is what I meant to say earlier. By the way, imagination and critical race theory are similar in nature to what we're doing here. Being able to be imaginative, there's, you're, there's no limitations on on your thoughts. And then that's what you're dealing with in this movie in the microcosm, you're seeing the limitation of someone who is now free. And they're like, now what do I do? You know, do I run or do I stay? So I need to eat. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, something as simple as that, which is very complex at the time period. I felt like positioning this in Afrofuturism allowed you to do so much and say so much. I want to kind of go back to this because in the scene with Amir and Patty Cakes, um, he does say, or at least my interpretation of what he says is very similar to what Georgie says in the beginning, which is in order for you to be liberated, you have to sacrifice so much. And, um, and this is somebody who is from the future. So I do want to ask you, is there a big different, a distance between the slave and the black millionaire or billionaire? No, I mean, that could be slavery, um, and, and, which is very interesting you bring that up. You can actually, in, in a hypothetical sense, substitute how slavery was historically depicted in this film substituted with modern slavery, corporate slavery. Um, you know, when you have more money, you have more problems, that can be slavery because you have to upkeep everything, you have to maintain everything, that's slavery. Um, and in a way, it's, um, you know, in our film, it, it, 
it's like history kind of repeated itself. Uh, and, you know, Enki in the beginning, when he travels, like in the animation portion, when he travels to the other planet, that's literally what is happening on the planet. And, you know, they're dealing with, you know, global warming, which is what, you know, we're dealing with, you know, today. And so the film kind of explores, uh, you know, I'm quite fascinated by how history really, you know, kind of repeats itself over time in, in, a, in a way. But yeah. I appreciated the travel, the geographical travel, the time travel, and uh, what I thought was the multiverse. You're right. You're right. right. Um, you know, you said earlier that this was, and Marlo, how much time do we have? 15 more minutes? Uh, all right, slow it down. All right, so earlier you said that this story, this movie, the concept for it was born of pushback right. over Michael Brown. Right, well, not specifically this story, but I think the evolution of myself as a, uh, as a storyteller. I think it just sparked something to um, for me to just dig deeper and you know like what I create like of course the number one job of a filmmaker is to you know create something that's entertaining the number two job and the second job of a filmmaker is to you know you know have something to say be passionate about something and um, yeah so I started back in 2018 with this concept I was like I just want to create something with any works on it together uh, story-wise, no, 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 so, no, can I just, can I just interrupt real fast? Yeah, yeah, energetics. So, I try not to, and I'm not good at this all the time, but I try not to call David and give him too much advice or ask too many questions. I want to give David the freedom, I think if I'm, if I'm involved, I think it's going to, you know, stifle his, his imagination, his ability to create, which is the genius that we love at David, like David's a genius, so, um, and I'm not just saying that people use the word genius and they say that people are geniuses, but they're really not geniuses. They're just really smart or something. <laughs> but David is really a genius because he can write really well. He composed all the music for the movie. I mean, every bit of it. He edited the entire movie himself. Um, he's, what else did he do? He, oh, he shot the movie. He had the camera on his shoulder while directing the movie. So David is absolutely a, a genius at this. And um, I don't mean to get off on the deep end, David, so you like that, but, but he's a genius. Anyway, so I, I try not to get involved too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sometimes best to get out of people's way and let them just right. roll with it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Wait, he was about to say, answer the question. Yes, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, 2018, uh, uh, I was just kind of like traveling around. I was introduced to the Afrofuturist community. Uh, I went out to Europe. I was in uh, London and Berlin for a conference. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Is that Afrofuturist community? Yeah. <laughs> like people who live together? Or? No, not like that. <laughs> but I mean, like, like a compound. <laughs> <laughs> it's a commune. Um, <laughs> where is it? No, like, no, but you know, it's just like a network of people, like, again, like who have, like scholars and academics who've been writing books and all kind of stuff. And, you know, a comic artist. Um, so there was like a conference in Europe and I was introduced to to a lot of them, a lot of the key players. And um, I mean, it just had like an impact on me. I was like, I could really kind of use this medium to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to up my storytelling game and, and, and really make my, my, my voice kind of unique. And so uh, 2018, 2019, I just started writing a story with one of my best friends. Uh, Justin Henley. We started doing a lot of research into uh, 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 East East African history, specifically Ethiopia, uh, some of uh, Afro Asiatic history, which was uh, Sumerian history, um, Mesopotamian history, uh, and we just decided to take a lot of these different elements. Um, uh, the the Cahokia Mounds that y'all saw in the film. Uh, that's a real place. It's like you know these pyramids, these mounds in St. Louis um, uh, that that still exists. You can visit. There's a whole museum. It's free. Um, and so me going there and I'm reading up on the history of that. Ironically, ironically, the uh, uh, 
Ironically, I mean, this, ironically, the, the name of that city is called City of the Sun, which is pretty interesting. I was like, whoa, okay, we must be on to something. We meant to be. Yeah, right? And so we pulled a little bit from ancient Cahokia history. It was one of the biggest uh, 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 Native American communities in uh, uh, in the country, bigger than London, at its peak. Um, and so we decided to pull a little bit on that. Uh, and, you know, it just became this amalgamation of, you know, there's a little bit of truth in what everybody's saying. Everybody can't be lying about all of this stuff. And uh, then you inject and infuse, you know, my imagination to it and, you know, my love for sci-fi and fantasy and things like that. That made it a little bit more entertaining. And uh, voila, you kind of got this really, you know, hybrid, uh, an amalgamation of every sci-fi movie probably ever made. Uh, so, yeah. And, and, you know, when I think about the things that you depict in here, particularly on the plantation, but then also this idea that some of it is born of, of you being from Ferguson. And, um, but this is sci-fi. And sci-fi is something that we fall in love with when we are children. Yes. So how do you negotiate this with your innocence? Yeah, it's so hard because uh, initially the script was, it was pretty basic, it was pretty surface level. Like there wasn't anything deeper than, you know, people fight with um, uh, uh, laser swords and it, like, like you can fight with laser swords. That's kind of what it was, uh, but you know, you dig deeper and you want to create something that's worth people time and you got to refine people out. Uh, from you know, actors and crew people out from different cities. I just got a fellowship at Washington University, so I need to have something to show for it. And Jason is, you know, helping undergird the film as well. And so it's like, there's pressure to actually deliver something good. You know, you can't just, be, you know, waste, you know. And so I, I try to respect all of that uh, while um, just trying to enjoy the process as well. You know, it takes, it's a twofold thing to balance an act. You're not gonna completely enjoy every moment, but, uh, you know, every moment's also not, uh, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not a pain in the ass, basically. You know, so, yeah. No, 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 I was just gonna, I was just gonna add on by saying uh, two things. One, going back to what he said about Cahokia Mounds. Has anyone, has anyone been to St. Louis? Or has anyone about St. Louis at all? So, if you know about St. Louis, it's, um, so I'm on the Missouri Historical Society Board, and right now we have an exhibit about Missouri, about St. Louis, and St. Louis is known as Mound City. So St. Louis, you have a bunch of mounds all through the East St. East Side and the Missouri side. Uh, and so that's the one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is, is that like with David, um, you know, giving David the the, the latitude as a, as a uh, Creative, right? Because you don't make money creating films that don't make money, right? So giving him the latitude and the comfort not to think about having to pay it back is absolutely essential for creators. They need to be they need to have that so they're not so it's not over their head that they're always trying to think about who I got to pay back, who I owe. You know, this doesn't happen because this is something that you know. It's an expensive process, and but the person who is doing it needs to have uh, that latitude and not to always be worried about what's going to happen if they don't succeed. So that's the one thing that David, I think, is I think is also trying to aim at when he's trying to answer that question. Well, I think we're all grateful that this film had those that tender care yeah. um, throughout the process. Pretty strong, and so um, uh, I think. It's like, all right, you you know, you watch it, especially with this. There's no A-list actor in the film or anything like that. Um, uh, and there's it's not a known IP, uh, and so you know, we wanted it to be like you're in good hands, basically. You know, it's a, it's okay. It's an independent film, but it's okay to go along the journey. And, you know, you can expect some excellence out of this. You know. Uh, but we were fortunate enough to work with a Nigerian company called Spoof Animation. Um, and they worked their butts off to, to deliver this for us. And I wrote it, and then they took it. Now, the, the hard part was, I have to be up at 1 a.m. 
you know, because they're like seven hours ahead. And so, <laughs> so I would be up at 1 a.m., you know, for like, you know, three or four weeks, um, like every day, just to make sure that you know, storyboards and stuff were right, and, and that um, what, they're, what they're creating is serving, servicing the story, because everything kind of circles back around in the end. Uh, you know, I didn't want nothing in the animation that was going to um, just, you know, just stick out and just be like, why, why was that there? Also, finally, um, it just kind of, the great thing about the animation is that it showed the possibility of what the, you know, the live action version could probably be like, you know, with, you know, you know, the budget and stuff was probably there, so, but yeah. Yeah, 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 he did. Check that out. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you all. You.